Hi friends, welcome to Plexus Ortho. My name is Dr. Kanan Kumar and today we're going to deal with a very important topic for your uh, uh, NEET PG and FMG exams and the topic is going to be named fractures in uh, orthopedics. So we almost invariably get one question from this section in your exam. So you must be very very thoroughly prepared and you must understand all these uh, named fractures and remember them very clearly. So let's start away, start straight away with the uh, named fractures. So we're going to start off with the distal radius. The distal radius has three named fractures, three or four named fractures. The one, the first one is called the Barton's fracture, right? The Barton's fracture is intra-articular fracture. So, so we have this, this is the distal radius, right? When you see the lateral view, any fracture which is outside the joint is called as the extra-articular fracture. Any joint which involves the fracture inside the joint is called the intra-articular fracture. So what happens in intra-articular fracture is basically the piece and the carpus moves along with the piece. So the uh, lunate, the carpus move along with the uh, radius volarly and this is called as a Barton's fracture. So the R is inside, so an intra-articular fracture, remember that, okay. So the R is inside Barton, so therefore it's an intra-articular fracture. If the carpus moves volarly, it is called as a volar button fracture. If the carpus or the fragment is dorsal and the carpus and the hand moves uh, dorsally, it is called as dorsal button fracture. So basically, distal radius fractures can be divided into extra-articular fractures and intra-articular fractures. Intra-articular fractures can be divi uh, divided again further into dorsal button fracture and volar button fracture dorsal button and volar button fractures. Extra articular fractures all of us know very well it is Coley's fracture and Smith's fracture. We will see images regarding both Coley's and Smith's fracture in the forthcoming slides. Okay so in this picture you can see that the there is a triangular piece of fragment the fracture seems to go, be going in the intra articular fashion so therefore this is a, and it is moving volarly. How do you make out it is the volar side because you can see the thumb here the thumb and the scaphoid are on the volar side and therefore this is the volar side and this is the dorsal side and the uh, whole of the carpus and the hand is moving volarly along with the fragment and therefore this is called as the volar button intra-articular fracture. For a recap, intra uh, distal radius fractures can be divided into intra-articular and extra-articular fractures. Intra-articular fractures can be divided into button that is volar button and dorsal button. Extra-articular fractures are Coley's fracture and Smith's fracture. <laughs> Okay, next uh, named fracture is the ba Bankart's fracture. We all know the Bankart lesion, which is the most common type of dislocation in the shoulder. It is the anterior shoulder dislocation. So when the shoulder dislocates anteriorly, it causes a uh, injury to the ligament, that is to the glenohumeral ligament, anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, and that is called the Bankart's lesion. The Bankart's lesion is an injury to the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. So basically remember the glenohumeral ligament. But if this dislocation is associated with a fracture of the glenoid, this is called as a Bankart's fracture. If you can see the end on view or the sagittal view of the glenoid, this is a glenoid. And if there is a fracture of the piece here, it is called as a Bankart's fracture. However, most of the time the dislocation occurs with a ligament tear here. The glenoid labrum is torn along with the glenoid humeral, glenohumeral ligament. Right? It is called the anterior glenohumeral ligament and this is the most common type which occurs with anterior dislocation of the shoulder and this is called the Bankart lesion. But sometimes the fracture occurs along with a piece of bone and this is called the Bankart fracture. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, named fracture. We know this uh, very well. Can you see the first uh, metacarpal base that is a thumb, that is the first carpometacarpal joint. You can see a small triangular piece of bone here. It is in two pieces. So B for by or two pieces. B is for by or two pieces of bone. Why? Because we have to differentiate this along with Rolando's fracture. Rolando's usually multi-fragmentary, right? So you must remember that. And uh, this bone, the um, the first metacarpal, the fracture is right here. There's a triangular piece of bone and the APL or abductor pollicis longus inserts into the base of the first metacarpal and pulls it dorsally or laterally and uh, therefore there is a subluxation of the first metacarpal or the thumb and this is called as a Bennett's fracture. Rolando's fracture has a three part or comminuted fracture and it does not displace. So when we, Rolando's fracture is an intra-articular fracture with two pieces something like this Y-shaped or V-shaped 
where the APL does not act on the whole of the metacarpal and the thumb or the first metacarpal stays in place. So in Rolando's fracture is a comminuted fracture, it does not displace or dislocate laterally. Bennett's fracture is a two-piece fracture where the bone dislocates laterally because of the effect of the APL. So remember by for B or two pieces in Bennett's fracture, Rolando's is multi-fragmentary bone fracture of the base of the first metacarpal. Now next is the Bosworth's fracture. Bosworth's fracture is a distal fibula fracture and the distal fibula gets caught behind the peroneal tendons. This is called Bosworth fracture dislocation. Bosworth fracture dislocation. What is a Bosworth fracture dislocation? is a distal fibula fracture with the entrapment of the fibula in the peroneal tendons in the peroneal tendons it is called as a Bosworth's fracture why is this of any consequence because you cannot do a close reduction because the tendons come in between and therefore you have to do an open reduction of this fracture to fix it appropriately right so this is called as Bosworth's fracture next very important we come to the boxer's fracture boxer's fracture when patients punch uh, uh, the wall or punch somebody, the fifth metacarpal neck is bent or fractured and this is called as a boxer's fracture. Fixed, fifth metacarpal neck is fractured and this is literally called the boxer's fracture. Boxer's fracture, remember that. Next is a chance fracture. Chance fracture is a vertebral fracture where the fracture line passes through the uh, vertebral uh, column, right? It goes through all the three vertebral columns, you know, all the Dennis column classification, anterior, middle and posterior. When the fracture line passes through all the three, frag uh, the three columns, it is called as a chance fracture. The chance fracture is a very commonly uh, seen fracture. Uh, in uh, seat belt injuries so you must remember what is called as a chance fracture which involves all three columns of the all three columns of the spine what are the three columns of the spine we know of anterior column middle column and posterior column right so the next we have uh, next distal radius fracture is the chauffeur's fracture in olden days they had to crank up the crank up the um, uh, car to start it and that time it used to hit back the chauffeur and therefore it used to cause a radial styloid fracture and this is called as a chauffeur's fracture. A radial styloid intraarticular fracture is called as the chauffeur's fracture. To repeat a radial styloid, a radial styloid fracture is called as the chauffeur's fracture. Next, what is Chopart's fracture dislocation? Chopart's fracture dislocation is through the Chopart's joint. Chopart joint is the mid-tarsal joint. It is between the talus and the navicular and the calcaneum and the cuboid. Right? So this is a mid-tarsal joint. Talonavicular and calcaneocuboid joints. Talonavicular and calcaneocuboid joints. A dislocation through this joint is called as a mid-tarsal or Chopart's fracture dislocation. A uh, Lis Frank's fracture dislocation is the dislocation between the tarso metatarsal joint. So, a dislocation at the level of the tarso metatarsal joint is called the Lis Frank's dislocation. C comes before um, L and therefore C is more proximal. Chopart's dislocation is more proximal in the mid tarsal joint and Lis Frank's dislocation is more distal in the tarso metatarsal joint. Right. Then you have what is called the clay shoveler's fracture. Clay shoveler's fracture is a spinous process fracture of C5, 6, 7 or T1. So C5, 6, 7 and T1 is called as a clay shoveler's fracture. Spinous process fracture of these are called as a spinous process is called as a clay shoveler's fracture. Then you have the simple Coley's fracture. This is a, as we discussed, the distal radius fractures can be divided into extra articular fractures and intra articular fracture. As you can clearly see, the uh, fracture line is going extra articular. Extra articular can be further divided into Coley's fracture, which is the most common, and Smith's fracture. If you fall with an outstretched hand with a dorsiflexed uh, wrist, then you have a Coley's fracture. When you have a palmar flexed wrist, you have a Smith's fracture. What is the difference between Coley's fracture and Smith's fracture? The uh, distal fragment is tilted dorsally in Coley's fracture C and D. So the Coley's fracture C 
and D. Colis fracture, the distal fragment is tilted dorsally. If the fragment is tilted volarly, it is called as Smith's fracture. Remember this, we will go through another slide where we show Smith's fracture. Colis fracture is basically dorsal tilt of an extra articular fracture. If there is a volar tilt of an extra articular fracture, it is called as a Smith's fracture. Then we have this uh, entity called as SX low pressity fracture. SX low pressity fracture is a basically an intraosseous membrane injury. So basically it is has three components. One it has a radial head fracture. Then you have an uh, intraosseous ligament injury. Then you have a dislocation of the DRUJ. So basically you have two forearm bones like this. When the radial head fractures along with an intraosseous membrane injury, the radius moves far away approximately as compared to the ulna. And so this is called as a SX low pressity injury. Hopefully you remember this because this has, has been asked before in your exams. Hopefully you get it right when you see this again in your exam. So SX low pressity is basically a dissociation between the radius and ulna. So the components are radial head fracture and intraosseous membrane injury and DRUJ dislocation because the radius moves proximally as compared to the ulna. Then you have the Galeazi fracture. So I got this uh, mnemonic from one of the uh, chat boxes. So we have this uh, Muggers. Okay, so Muggers is M for Montegia and U for Ulna. When Montegia fracture, the Ulna is fractured. Whereas in Galeazi, G for Galeazi and R for radius. So basically Galeazi fracture is a radius fracture with DRUJ dislocation. Galeazi fracture and Montegia fracture. Galeazi fracture is radius fracture plus DRUJ dislocation. Whereas Montegia is an ulna fracture with the proximal radial ulna dislocation or the radial head dislocation. So this is the difference between Montegia and Galeazi. So remember the mnemonic Muggers, M for Montegia, uh, U for ulna fracture, G for Galeazi and R for radius fracture. So the next one we have is called the hangman's fracture. Why is it called the hangman's fracture? When you hang somebody or during death penalty, the bone that is fractured is the C2 and or the axis bone and that is what uh, compresses the or damages the spinal cord where the respiratory centers are there and the patient dies. So basically this is the hangman's fracture where the C2 or the axis bone is fractured. Then you have the Halston Lewis fracture very commonly asked question where it is a spiral oblique or an up middle third lower third fracture of the humerus and because of this this spike presses into the radial nerve when it is going coming from posterior to anterior piercing the lateral intermuscular septum and then you have an injury to the radial nerve there and this is called as a Halston Lewis fracture. Halston Lewis fracture is an upper uh, sorry a middle third distal third humerus fracture where the spike of the lower third of the distal humerus presses into the radial nerve when it is entering from posterior to anterior through the lateral intramuscular septum and the radial nerve gets caught there and this causes a radial nerve palsy and this is called a Halstein Lewis fracture of the humerus. Then we have the, CE, uh, the uh, C1 fracture or the Atlas fracture and this is called as the Jefferson fracture. C1 fracture is called as a Jefferson fracture. This occurs because of axial compression to the head where the C1 or the uh, atlas bone is fractured and this is called as called as Jefferson fracture. Then we have the Jones fracture. So we all uh, discussed that the fifth metacarpal neck fracture is called as boxer's fracture. Whereas the fifth metatarsal base is called as the Jones fracture. What is special about this fracture? This has poor blood supply here. There is a decreased chance of uh, union rate here and therefore it is of significance and this is called as Jones fracture. Fifth metatarsal base fracture is called as Jones fracture. Then we have Liss Frank's fracture. We just discussed Chopart's fracture. Chopart fracture is the mid tarsal fracture dislocation between the talonavicular and calcaneocuboid joints whereas the Liss Frank's uh, dislocation is the uh, uh, junction between the tarso metatarsal joints between the tarsal bones that is a cuboid and the cuneiform bones and the metatarsal bones. So basically there is a ligament from the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal. So this is the first metatarsal, the second metatarsal, then you have the medial cuneiform, middle cuneiform, lateral cuneiform. Between the medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal you have the Lis Frank's ligament. When this is injured, Lis Frank's ligament. When this 
the whole of the lateral metatarsals dislocate or get uh, subluxed uh, uh, laterally and this causes what is called as a lis franks fracture dislocation so it is called as a lis franks fracture dislocation and remember about this uh, ligament from the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal base then you have the mason neves fracture this is a similar fracture to the sx loperasty where the intraosseous membrane is injured and the radius moves proximally to the ulna in the mason neves fracture there is a proximal third fibula fracture and there is an intraosseous membrane rupture and therefore there is an increase or some kind of dislocation in the ankle joint so mason neves fracture is similar there is an intraosseous membrane disruption and the fibula moves forward and therefore there is a dislocation or a disruption in the ankle joint so this is called as a mason neves fracture which is similar to the sx loperasty fracture in the upper limb then we have the malgagnes fracture malgagnes fracture is some kind of uh, both superior and inferior pubic rami fracture along with si joint disruption or the iliac wing therefore the one side of the uh, uh, pelvis moves proximally or distally and this is called as a vertical shear fracture or malgagnes fracture malgagnes or vertical shear fracture where the superior inferior pubic rami and the si joint of ipsilateral side is disrupted and because of which the ipsilateral hemi pelvis moves forward or um, moves superiorly or inferiorly and this is called as malgagnes fracture then you have the march fracture all of us know march fracture because uh, new recruits in the army do a lot of march past or running and uh, they develop uh, fractures in the second and third metatarsal and this is called as a stress fracture of the second and third metatarsals and this is called as a march fracture why march because they do a lot of new march past the new army recruits do it and therefore they have stress fracture of the second and third metatarsal and this is called as the march fracture right then we have already discussed about montegia fracture so we have what is called as a muggers uh, mugger is the mugger is the um, uh, mnemonic for it right so m for montegia u for ulna so therefore there is an ulna fracture how do you recognize that this is the ulna you can see the olecranon here and this is continuous as the bone and therefore this is the ulna you can see the radial head here and therefore this is the radial head so you have a ulna fracture and you have a radial head dislocation and therefore this is called as a montegia fracture if you have a galezi fracture the galezi fracture dislocation that is you have a radial fracture with a distal radial not disruption and that is called as a galezi fracture so remember this it's very simple and you must not make any mistakes in your exam regarding montegia and galezi fractures then you have the pipkins fracture dislocation pipkins fracture dislocation is a dislocation of the uh, femoral head either posteriorly or anteriorly which is the most common dislocation of the uh, hip it is a posterior dislocation which is the most common dislocation of the shoulder it is the anterior dislocation of the shoulder and what is the lesion associated with the anterior dislocation of the shoulder bankart lesion and we just saw that if the glenoid is fractured it is called as a bankart fracture here we have a pipkin fracture dislocation where the uh, hip is dislocated posteriorly and sometimes a small piece of head is left behind in the socket or acetabulum which is attached to the ligamentum teres and this is called as a pipkin fracture dislocation where a piece of bone attached to the ligamentum teres remains inside the socket and this is called as a pipkin fracture dislocation what is it called pipkin fracture dislocation of the hip then we have the two important entities for the uh, ankle one is called as a pots fracture and the second one is called as a cotton's fracture what is pots fracture pots fracture is bimedullar fracture you have a distal fibula fracture and a dis and the medial medullus fracture so this is called as a pots or a bimedullar fracture when you have a trimedullar fracture it is called as a cotton's fracture along with these two when you have in this is in the lateral view this is the talus right and then you have the calcaneum below along with the bimedullar you have a posterior medullus fracture it is called as a cotton's or a trimedullar because all the three medulli are fractured trimedullar fracture so c is a third letter in the alphabet and t is tri so therefore a cotton's fracture is a trimedullar fracture that's how you can remember cotton's or trimedullar fracture what is pot spine all of you know pot spine is a spinal tuberculosis 
the same way pots fracture is bimalar fracture and cotton's fracture is trimalar fracture then we have already discussed this rolando's fracture bennett's fracture is a simple b for by simple two part fracture as a rolando is a comminuted fracture rolando is a comminuted fracture so you have a y shaped fracture here right and because the apl is the one which acts and sublock apl attaches here and higher and pulls the whole of the metacarpal laterally but in this case it cannot do so because this fragment is here st stationary and is separated from the metacarpal shaft and therefore there is no subluxation in the rolando's fracture so bennett's fracture is a by or two fragment piece and with subluxation rolando's is a comminuted without any subluxation then you have the isolated distal third uh, fibula fracture which is seen in runner's fracture new runners or marathon runners can have this kind of a fracture because their fibula is very weak and this is called as a runner's fracture isolated isolated distal third fibula fracture is called as a runner's fracture then you have the seagon's fracture right can you see anything in this picture you can see a small avulsion fracture of a small piece of bone on the lateral side of the uh, proximal tibia why do why is it the lateral side because it is on the side of the fibula fibula is the always the lateral part of the uh, tibia or the leg uh, portion and therefore this is a lateral portion and you have you see a small avulsion of piece of bone here this is called as sigon's fracture what is its significance it is attached to something called as anterior longitudinal ligament all anterior longitudinal ligament this is pathognomonic for an acl injury pathognomonic for acl injury remember that so a uh, sigon's fracture is uh, pathognomonic for an AC a acl anterior cruciate ligament injury anterior cruciate ligament injury okay so whenever they ask you about sigon's fracture or anterior longitudinal ligament injury this indicates that the acl is injured so that is called as sigon's fracture then we have already discussed about smith's fracture when you fall on outstretched hand with dorsiflexion of the wrist it causes colli's fracture there is a dorsal displacement c and d colli's fracture dorsal displacement of the distal fragment when you fall with the palmar flexion of the wrist then you have a volar displacement of the distal fragment and called as smith's fracture okay to recap distal radius fractures can be divided into extra articular or intra articular extra articular can be colli's fracture with a dorsal displacement c and d colli's is c and d for dorsal displacement then you have the uh smith's fracture where there is volar displacement of the distal fragment then you have intra articular fracture where you have the barton type you have the volar barton and the dorsal barton fractures the next fracture uh, is called the tilo fracture tilo fracture is where the uh, before the fusion of the physis it usually happens in adolescents okay it usually happen happens in adolescents where the antero medial fragment it is attached to the anterior tibio fibular ligament and when this piece gets fractured this ligament pulls it so it is an avulsion injury of the anterior tibio fibular ligament atfl anterior tibio fibular ligament so when you see a, a axial section of the tibia this is the piece that is fragmented this is a fibula here and the attachment of the anterior tibio fibular ligament and this piece is fractured and this is called as tilo's fracture usually happens before the closure of physis in adolescence okay so so these are some of the named fractures that uh, um i wanted to discuss with you today there are a few more i think i have missed out a few named fractures please let me know in the comment section about the uh, named fractures that i have missed which are important for your exam uh, i will make a separate video of those missed fractures i hope uh, this video is of some use to you guys uh, please do let me know if uh, there are any other fractures that have to be discussed thank you for hearing me out my name is dr kanan kumar and this is plexus ortho thank you very much